It didn't work. Hello, hello. All right, all right. Welcome on in, welcome on in. I know I like to get started on time. So give me one second. And did I stop the recording or are we recording? I think I am recording. Okay, my bad. What is up, y'all? What is up? So I thought I put this on Do Not Disturb, but I just heard something. So let me fix that. How's everybody doing today on this hump day? Out here in Colorado, if you were out here in Colorado, it is ugly. It is snowing outside and um, and I don't like it. I don't like it. The roads are ugly this morning. It was it was a thing. Okay, so we're going to jump right in and get started. Thank you for joining the High Performance at High Noon call. And I am your girl, Jice Johnson. I am your work-life integration strategist. And this call happens every Wednesday at 2 p uh, 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, and 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So um, I don't have a lot of church announcements today, actually. Uh, my calendar is open if you want to talk about work-life integration, if you want to talk about doing more of what you love, and I'll talk a little bit about that because that is really the topic of today. So we're going to talk about lemons and lemonade because it is, um, it's a whole thing. Um, and I will start by acknowledging some of my own experience of this week. This has been a tough week for me. Um, in ways that um, I have not normally had, um, in ways that I am, I have been frustrated, right? And so what does that look like when you are a high performance coach, when you are a work-life integration strategist, and you are not having a good day? You were not having a good week and you got to sit here and talk to your clients and be like, life is wonderful, right? But I don't like to do that. I really like to have like transparent moments. So that's what I'm going to have um, today. I'm going to have a transparent moment, right? And so oftentimes we've all heard the the phrase like, is life giving you lemons? Um, if life gives you lemons, right? Make lemonade. But I think sometimes that's easier said than done. And so I want to talk a little bit about like why or what the space of like work-life integration actually looks like, what this is, how this actually flows, because I can't think of any high-performance professional that has not experienced a, a tough time. Matter of fact, high-performance professionals experience a lot of tough times that we oftentimes just push through because when there's a problem at work, when there's a problem with our business, when there's a problem in our career field, wherever that in the community, right, we know who to turn to. We turn to us. We turn to the ones that we know are going to get it done. We turn to the ones that are going to make it happen. And so high performance professionals in that space are often the ones that are, are being drained and our cup becomes empty. And so, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about is making sure that we're pouring from a full cup, not pouring from that space of uh, not pouring from our cup, but really pouring from the overflow, right? So like, what are the things that we need to do to fill our cup, to be the most successful, to have what it is that we need to have? And then out of the overflow is where we give of our gifts and our talents and our skills so that we're able to give in a way that actually is fulfilling, that is focused, that is intentional. So if you're just joining us, we're about to start talking about lemons and lemonade, because let me just tell y'all in real life, your girl's having a hard week. OK, normally look, I'm about to show I have nothing on my paper. I just want to show, I have no notes. OK, no notes. But if you want to look at all the rest of my pages, they are filled with notes from before, because all I do is take notes on here. When I come to y'all, I don't come to y'all with anything. You know, I, I come to y'all prepared. Right. So I have no notes because I've had a hard week and I wanted to talk about that in real life. What does it look like when you have a hard time in real life? So this week has given me lemons and how do I make lemonade? So the concept of work-life integration, um, first of all, let me actually back up. This actually, this pro, um, process actually started with 
intentional living, right? And then people didn't really know what like intentional living was. And then on top of like not knowing what intentional living is, then when I started saying work-life integration, it was like, well, what is that? So, okay, y'all heard of work-life balance, put, you know, put a one in the chat if you heard of one work-life balance. So there's work-life balance. The reason why I don't like balance is because balance indicates that you, like you can't have, you can't have this focused attention and then also have balance. You can't be driving and pushing towards something that you need to make happen and then also have balance. And so oftentimes we end up being stretched thin, trying to achieve this like equilibrium in a way that doesn't actually benefit us in a way that's not, that doesn't help us in the long run. So how do you integrate, especially again, high performance professionals, right? We ain't talking about everybody. We're not talking about, we're talking about high performance professionals. Those of us that are out here achieving, those of us that are out here making moves, those of us that are driving towards a goal and a thing that we want to do, a thing that we're passionate about and, and um, the impact that we want to make. And I want to make that distinguish, that distinctment, distinguishment, distinguishment between <laughs> everyone else and the high performance professionals, right? And those distinction. of us. Distinction. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I make that distinction <laughs> um, between those of us that are high performance professionals and those and, and everyone else, because we have a different, we're made up of a different kind of drive. So because of that, and, and as I mentioned um, at the start, we are often the ones that are called on when something is needed. So because of that, because of that space, we have to learn how to integrate work and life. If you own a business and you leave to go on vacation, and then all hell breaks loose on your business, you're not like the employee, right? You're not like the, I'm, I'm gonna get to that in one second, Jay. Thank you for throwing that in there. Um, you're not like the, you're not like the, the employee that gets to take a vacation where if everything goes wrong at the job, that they, they're not responsible, when you are a C-suite professional, when you are a high level executive, when you are the owner of the business, when you play that kind of key role, when something goes wrong, it really doesn't matter where you are. You're going to almost be required to stop and turn around and take care of whatever that situation is. Whether you have to give an authorization, whether you have to give a delegation, maybe you don't have to hop on a plane, but they might require your green light before they can actually even make a move. So there are times where we try to create this like hardcore boundary that in, in ways that that boundary may not be able to exist, or you may have to work to scale to get that boundary to exist, right? So like, I'm sure you can make it to the top levels of Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, whatever that looks like, and actually be able to pull away because there is some, a number two that can pull the green light for you. But for the vast majority of us that have this type of driving personality, like, we don't have a number two that can make all the right calls for us. And so if it gets all the way up to our desk, if it gets to our email, if it gets to our voicemail, our text message, we're the ones that are required to make those calls. So when you think about integrating your work and your life, it's a way in which you can live in a, like have the drive and the ambition and, you know, make the impact that you want to make at the same time that you get to have um, the attention that you want for your family, the attention that you need for yourself. So the concepts inside of work-life integration is how it's, it's, it teaches you how to take lemons and make them lemonade so that that concept isn't some, you know, high pie in the sky. It sounds good. How do I make lemonade out of some lemons? Because, you know, you need all the rest of the ingredients. Where do those things come from? So the idea in this space is to give you an opportunity to think through the tools or to develop the tools that you need in your tool belt so that when shit hits the fan and life happens, you have the tools to really help you navigate through that and actually keep going. Because here's the difference between people who achieve their goals and people that don't. And this is why I say, again, I'm talking to the high performance professionals because how many people actually achieve goals that they set? We're in mid-February. How many people do you think have fallen off their goals? The ones they set in January, just 45 days ago, that have fallen off. Some of them fell off before they got started. So roughly, statistics say, roughly 8% of people actually accomplish their goals. And most of those people that manage to accomplish their goals are high-performance professionals. They're the ones that can set a goal and actually work hard to get there and make that achievement happen. But what happens when life keeps on lifing. 
And how do we come equipped so that we're not stripped away, so that we're not left overwhelmed, so that we're not left with anxiety, so that we're not left with stress, right? And that we can still keep moving and driving forward. So as I get into a couple of the tools that I have used this week, I have no notes. I just showed y'all that. So I'm just going to talk to y'all about how what, the tools that I have had to implement this week in order to still have a highly productive week, even though it's been a hard week. Um, so the, the, the space that I want to start with in the tools that we have in our tool belt, the first one is the ones that we have, the ones that we have up here, this, this brain of ours, our mind. Our mindset is wildly important. When you see people who set a goal, who set a target, who have something that they're working on and they just stop, right? Something bad has happened. And let like, let's dig into like some of the real things that can happen. Injury, death, financial situations, right? Like when we really start digging into the heart of things that can really rock you, and stop you in your tracks, even though the world is continuing to go, your world has been stopped, right? What makes the difference between the person who puts down their goal, never picks it back up, or maybe they just had a hard week, maybe they just had a hard day, versus the person that recognizes that they are facing an adversity and is still managing to figure out how they're going to move forward with that ad through the adversity. And that starts with the mindset. That starts with how you're actually thinking about your life, how you're thinking about your goals, how you even view and see yourself as a person. So I have had to work on my mindset in order for me to see myself as a person that wins no matter what. Not like I'm beating you or you or you, I'm beating me. I'm beating my personal best. I'm beating the things that have stopped me in the past. I'm beating those things. But when life has stopped you in the past, and this is why um, I'm going to pull this question in that um, that Jade said in here, but I, I'm going to pull this question in, right? When life has beat me in the past, what is a story that I've told to myself? How do I view myself? How am I seeing myself? And if I don't see myself as a winner, if I don't see myself as an overcomer, if I don't see myself as capable of making it through this, I will stop. I have stopped in the past. And so the first thing that has happened over time as I as I have continued to grow in my profession and continue to grow in my income and continue to grow as a person is I've had to change how I see myself and I have to change how I think about myself. So um so Jade actually said this directly to me so I'm sorry that I'm putting it out here. It's out here now girl I didn't said it. Um so Jade said I don't think I'm I don't think I'm a high performance professional. I don't feel, I feel like I'm not producing enough. But how many of us have ever felt like we're not producing enough? How many of us have ever felt like we've fallen short? So just look around at the nodding heads, Jay, you're in good company. Cause we've all been there. We've all been there. I had to, I actually had to have my coach remind me today and it's only Wednesday to go through my list from Monday through the first half of today, because I had to talk to my coach before I got on this call, <laughs> like, and actually go through and say, what have you checked off the list? Even in your worst, when you feel like you're at your worst week, look what you've accomplished. So I think there are times that we don't give ourselves enough credit because we're telling ourselves one story and we're not actually accounting for our wins. So that is a tool of high performance is to actually count your wins. And oftentimes we will go, we will get a win and we will breeze right through it. We don't take the time to acknowledge it. We don't take the time to pat ourselves on the back. We don't take the time to congratulate ourselves. And there are some schools of thought that exist that way. And there are times that you have to ask yourself how that affects you. Like, for example, I don't know if you all have ever heard of David Goggins. I love David Goggins, right? However, David Goggins would be like, pat myself on the back for what? <laughs> like, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to keep driving, right? And there may be times, this is why they're tools, right? You can't hit everything like a hammer. Every, you know, what is it? What's the, what's the phrase you hit? If you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Ain't that the phrase? Something like that. So you have tools to use at different times. If in the moment, motivation is not necessarily what you need, or if you're not, if you are seeing yourself as who you truly are in that moment, like I don't think that David Goggins at his current level sees himself as not performing. So when he performs, 
he doesn't have an issue with trying to remind himself that he is a performer, that he wins, that he has done well. So he's driving through other emotions. What is the tool that you can use when you don't feel like you're producing enough? That's when you go back and look at your wings. So you can start making a note of, actually, I did this, I did this, I did this, right? And then asking yourself, like, what, what, what's realistic in a day? If I pack on 30 things on my to-do list, this is a real story because I have done this on so many occasions. I don't know how many of y'all to-do lists be like, Phew. and you look at that list and then you look at the actual amount of time that you have in a calendar, on the calendar, and you know there is no humanly possible way without a team, without delegation, without some money somewhere. With, I mean, there's not enough hours in the day for the things that you put on your list to fit on your calendar. When you come to that recognition and you see that this is not a thing that's going to happen, what tools do you use to fix this so that you don't see yourself as a failure when you've only checked off three out of the 30 things? Were they three things that drove you forward? Were they three things that actually... Um, uh, you know, produce something for you? Were they the three, were they the top three things or were they the bottom three things, right? How do you get to measure when you have too much on your plate versus the time? So what makes you producing enough or not enough? What are you measuring that against? And so that you can begin to adjust your mindset in order to see yourself as who you actually are and not how you feel in the moment. So adjusting your mindset is a tool. Another tool is a reset. I like to reset. Today, yesterday, Monday, your girl had to reset. Like, I got out the bed, dropped the kids off, got back in the bed and tried again. I was like, well, we're going to set our alarm and we're going to wake up <laughs> and try this all over again because it didn't go right, right, right? So, of course, everyone doesn't have that ability. Like, I literally work from home. You were looking at my home office, right? So I have that ability to move a meeting and lay back down in the bed, take a nap and reset. If you are at an office, maybe you don't have that time. So what are other opportunities that you can take to reset that may not be an actual nap? So you can do something as small as a mindful minute, like to take a moment, close your eyes and actually check in with self. How is my heart feeling? Not like emotional, how is my heart feeling? Like physically, is my heart pumping too fast? Am I feeling anxiety? Do I need to take some deep breaths, right? Or like, how am I feeling emotionally? Some of us don't check in with ourselves and we walk through and someone, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, but you're not good at all. So how do you take a moment to like check in with yourself? If you have longer than a minute, I suggest taking it for a real reset, for a full reset, I should say. But, uh, but even just getting to a place, a baseline of acknowledging how you feel so that you can start to right set this in your mind. If I am experiencing a lot of anxiety, that is an issue that I struggle with. I experience anxiety. When I'm experiencing anxiety, I need to take a moment to take some deep breaths. I usually like to plant my feet straight on the ground, open up my chest, take some deep breaths. Sometimes I will stretch, stretch up, stretch out. Like I don't have to like this. You don't got to look like you in the gym, right? Just take a deep uh, breath, take some stretches. I said that the other way. Take a stretch and take some deep breaths and check in with myself to remind my body that I am safe that I am good, right? And so I can let this anxiety re re be released out of my body. Because again, I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to those of us that get out here and perform. We are the number one folks that carry stress and anxiety. Anxiety is on the rise. Stress is on the rise. Overwhelm is on the rise. Burnout is on the rise. So I, I know I'm not the only one who experiences that. But if you don't have a tool, you can go through your whole day experiencing anxiety that just continues to build because you don't have the tool to release it, to remind yourself that you are okay, that whatever the situation is that needs to be addressed can be addressed when you are focused, when you are intentional, and when you are operating at your best capacity, not at your worst capacity. So you can take a mindful minute, you can take a moment to meditate, you can take a walk. Now, if you're in Colorado, I don't recommend that today. It is cold and snowy. However, a walk 
a brief walk, a walk down the hall, a walk around the building, a walk in my, like for me, I would take a walk in the neighborhood. So what are some of the things that you can do to reduce that? One of the things that I do when I am having anxiety is I actually reduce my amount of caffeine. I don't reduce it so much that I get a headache because, you know, if you do drink, I, I'm, I'm at least a double every day. So if I, if I don't have any caffeine, I will have a headache, but I will do something small, a small dose of caffeine, a half a cup of coffee, something like that, that will save away the headache, but also like things like caffeine increase anxiety levels. So when you start to understand how your body is operating, like the knowledge and the tuning in of your body can help you make an adjustment. So this week I've worked on my mindset I've worked on my breathing and my mindfulness moments, my, my resets. And the last thing that I'll talk about is journaling. So some of us are avid journalers and some of us don't see the purpose in journaling at all. Like, why am I writing down my feelings? <laughs> what am I going to do with this? But I actually highly recommend journaling. Um, maybe I can look into some of the scientific, there's science, scientific data that backs journaling. Um, I just don't have those statistics memorized, those statistics memorized to blurt, um, blurt them out to you. But there is data that talks about the importance of journaling. Um, it is another opportunity for you to check in and figure out what is actually going on, what is taking place, what is going wrong, right? Because sometimes we're making rash decisions. Sometimes we're not sticking to the tools that we have in our tool belt. One of the tools that I was talking to my clients about this week, um, we have our little separate, um, we have our separate uh, a group chat and it kept coming up and it kept coming up and it kept coming up over and over. And so I reminded them about the four Ds. I reminded them, and I think I talked about this a little bit last week, but I reminded them that when you have too much on your, on your plate, you actually need to review what you have going on and walk through the four Ds. What can you do? What do you what do you need to do? Only you. Like no one else can do it. No one there's no plan B. It's just you. You're the one. What do you need to do on this list? What can you delegate on the list? Delegation can look like anything. Like I have delegated laundry to my kids, okay? Cuz I am overwhelmed. Like actually today y'all are going to do the laundry. Mom's done. Right? I mean, so like what is what is overwhelming your plate and what can you delegate? So whether that is to an assistant, a coworker, whether that is to a kid, a spouse, a friend, um, where where does where that someone on Fiverr or Thumbtack or Upwork, right? What can you get off your plate and delegate to someone else? What can you defer? Like this needs to happen, but it actually doesn't need to happen right now. We can actually we can move this a week down the line, we can bump this. A month down the line, this can can get kicked six months down the line. It's not a top priority. I have it here for whatever reason, but at the moment I'm feeling overwhelmed. I need to move this. And then what just needs to be deleted? Like, actually, this is just a no. So when you walk through your calendar and you're looking at your to-do list, right? Walk through in those four Ds. Walk through what I actually need to do, what I can delegate, what I can defer, and what can what do I delete? and see how that starts to clear things up for you so that you can take a breath, so that you can start to relieve some of that anxiety. Maybe you have a big project coming up. Maybe you have a deadline that you need to meet and now you need to rearrange some things. One of the things that I have found, this is not my experience. Um, well, it has been, but it's not my current experience. I was walking a client through some of this um, last week was around actually like removing and mo moving calendar appointments around because they didn't want to disappoint the people on the other side of the calendar, right? Like we set this appointment, so I need to keep it. But do you need to keep it? Do you need to keep it? Like that's that. those are questions that we have to ask ourselves, especially the higher up that we get on the chain, like some of us forget who we are. I remember having that same experience. This person is the CEO of their business. I had to remind them when I remembered that I was a CEO of my own business. I am the CEO and I'm talking to another CEO. We are on the same level. I might be the CEO talking to somebody who is lower than the CEO, right? So like, how do you walk in and remember that you get to take up space too? 
And if you're not at a 10, if you're not at a nine, if you're not at whatever your acceptable rate late, uh, level is, right? Like what's your acceptable level that like once I drop below here, I'm just no good to nobody, not even to myself. So how do I reset? So um, I'm gonna pause here and uh, take some time to open up. I just, you know, acknowledge um, it's what it's like to have, have a rough week. And how do you utilize the tools that you have in order to get through that and to get through it where you can still be productive, where you can still keep your cup full um, and where you can just acknowledge that sometimes life lifes, right? And so that's, those are some of the, the, the ways in which we start making lemonade out of lemons. I hope this is helpful. Has this been helpful to anyone? Awesome. What questions do we have? What comments do we have? So I have more of a comment than really a question. And it's a reflection of something, a habit that I have gotten um, into that I need to break. You okay. mentioned moving calendars. First of all, good morning and hello and happy Wednesday, everyone. Um, so my name is Manushka. I work full-time at the Women's Foundation, but I have a business called Chubby Curls, which I am working to no longer make my side hustle to for it to be my main focus. So, um, but I, having said that, I do love the work that I do um, and it is meaningful and it is for women's empowerment. I will not go down the rabbit hole, but I will say what I do is I move my own reminders Perfect example. I need to renew my passport. Jice, I know, has a very fun upcoming trip. And I am like jelly for all the people who have these fun trips coming up. And it's not, it's not obviously mission critical, but it's one of those things. It's not even work related, but it's a reflection of other things that are work related that I do do, where the reminder will come up and oh, okay, I'll move it to Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon will come and I'll move it. So like help. <laughs> How yeah. do I stop? How do I commit to just do it? So one of the things that I teach, okay, so I started off by talking about how this, um, you know, the program that I teach is around integrate, you know, work-life integration, right? And it's really a holistic approach to your life. And so our lives are kind of put in these buckets. For mine, I call it my 5F framework. Um, if you go onto my website, like scroll all the way to the bottom, there's actually a picture of my um, 5F framework on there so you can see it. But you have your, these are the essentially, so I've already been talked like, why don't I make this the 8F framework? I'm not. Um, the first F is friends, family, and fun, right? Kind of all in one bucket. You have your finances, you have your fitness or your health, you have your faith or your spirituality, and you have your field, that's your career or, you know, what, what, what work that you do. So those are the five Fs. These all together create a holistic picture of your life, right? What does your money look like? Your body, your spirituality, your, um, you know, your money and like the people that you love the most, right? And, and what you do for your fun time. When you move around things that you have told yourself are a priority for you, and then you move them around in place of what? What, what, you move them around to do what else? Just, it, it could be anything. It could be something that's work-related, a project that like, you know, may have come up that is, uh, you know, needs, a, has a deadline or um, it's, it's just, it's usually just something else. And so what you've yeah. told yourself, this is what you've told yourself subliminally. You've told yourself that the things that you want to accomplish for you are not important. Other things are more of a priority than it is for you to take care of the things that you have deemed to be important for yourself. I would assure you that you're also not alone in that. We have all done that. When we are, when we are professionals that are dedicated to the things that we do, it is easy for us to bypass the things that we have deemed important for ourselves. This is the, when I talk about work-life integration, you know, the one thing that I rarely have to talk about is people's work because that's the one thing that we are clear on. We are going to work. It's everything else. It's, I don't have time to make it to the gym. I don't have time to cook a healthy dinner. I don't have time to take vacation. I don't have time with my children, but you know what's done? That work project. That's the whole point of how do you build a holistic life that allows you to integrate what you need to do for yourself. Because the reason why people are feeling burnt and overwhelmed and are pouring from empty cups is not because 
they don't get their work done. It's because all they do is get their work done. So you're probably stellar at work, but they're, but but you can't travel when you get ready or you can't leave the country when you're ready to leave the country because you haven't taken the time for you, right? So you have to ask yourself, how important is it for you to take care of you and make and put put the the time, the blocks of time that you're doing something for yourself in that space and hold to it. And actually hold to it. And and so when you're going back to this is going to come back to the four D's. When you come back into your calendar and you see I have this for me and I have this upcoming work deadline, what else can be moved around? What do you need to delete off the calendar? It's not the things for yourself. Not really, not all of them. But then maybe there are choices to make. I can go to my nail appointment or I can go get my passport. Right? So you get to make some determinations about what you're deleting. But if you keep moving obligations further and further down the line, if you keep kicking a can down the line, then you have to ask yourself, is it really important? Maybe it's just not important in 2023 for you to leave the country. And I, I really like maybe like maybe 2024 is the, the time that you leave the country because in 2023, your plate is full and you don't have time to go and renew your passport. But then make an intentional decision that like, I don't have time this year to do this. So then it's not something that's hovering over your head. I think one of the worst things that we do is we don't make a decision. I'm going to get this done or I'm not going to get this done. And then we can make a decision about it. Like I really want to, in my heart, I feel like it would be great if I could, but if I have to keep kicking this can down the road, if I, it's one thing to defer once, it might be a thing to defer twice. If I got to defer it three times, it needs to be deleted, right? So how do we make those decisions and then just live with them? Like you actually feel a sense of pressure come off of your plate when you've just made a decision even if it wasn't an easy decision. Like, I really want this, but I've decided I'm not gonna have it. And then that way it's just a done deal. So how do you relieve your brain of that pressure? Does that make sense? Before, hold on one second, Andrew, before there was a question in the comments, Brian says, is your journaling free form or do I follow that? So I, here's what I do. My journaling is free form, but I do have a gratitude that I process. So I have, I do three gratitudes every day. Um, those gratitude, I mean, it's literally, I am grateful for, and I have three things. Sometimes they're long form. Like sometimes I'm really going in cause I feel amazing. And I, and I see just goodness everywhere. And sometimes my gratitude is as simple as, well, you know what? I woke up and my home is warm and I'm grateful. I, I woke up and I heard my kids laughing and it sounds amazing. So like I, the practice of gratitude is structured for me. Um, and then the rest of my journaling is not. Yep, I think having a gratitude journal is is amazing. That is like my one go-to. So if I can't do my entire morning routine, then the one thing I do is my gratitude. So my whole morning routine would include me like journaling, meditating, um, my affirmations and my gratitudes. But like if I'm running late, something has happened, I, I can sit down and in a minute and a half, I can write out three things I'm grateful for. So that's kind of my baseline. Um. I do go back to my journal, actually. Um, Y'all might laugh at me back here. Y'all see all that? <laughs> just, so I don't, just so I don't give advice that I don't keep. I actually do. I go back and I review um, my journals. I go back and I review like my goals. I also keep vision boards. Um, my vision boards are more wordy than they are graphic. Um, and I actually, I, I hold on to them. So as things that I have, have come to fruition, um, you know, I get, I get to check off, right. And say, okay, I've hit this goal. I've hit this mark. Um, and so I do, I use those for a couple of things. Sometimes I use them for reference points, not just the, um, the vision boards, but the journals. So I will, um, use them for reference points. And I also use them as my own internal sounding board. So at times, if I'm really having a struggle with something and I, you know, I feel today I feel you know warm about it. Tomorrow I feel hot about it. The next day I feel cold about it. I want to start really journaling and try to figure out like what's happening in this space so that I can begin to really process what am I feeling? Why am I feeling? Why am I feeling so volatile? 
and kind of also look around what might be happening in the rest of my space to see if there's something that's affecting something else, right? Like, oh, I realized that I haven't gotten a lot of sleep this week. So that's why my, you know, I keep jumping up and down about it. Um, and so that way I can hope, I, what I try to do is not make emotional decisions. And I'm a Pisces, so I'm wildly emotional. So I try to <laughs> pull that in. Yep. Um, and oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Andrea, you had something? Yeah, just a comment if that's okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, a, a couple of things um, to the group. I've been extremely successful in my life. Um, as a parent, uh, in a business, just everything about my life has been very successful. Now, what's interesting is I don't care about other people's definition of what that looks like. I've made my own definition. And I think the other thing that I've learned about life is that we're living in a time when people and things are out of order. 25-year-old falls out on a football field. Another young man kicks a field goal and passes out and dies. So if you being able to spend time with that first F, -U -F family, friends, forever, something like that. I'm right. sorry if I didn't get it right. Family, friends, and fine. Yeah. Um, right. I promise you that on your deathbed, those will be the only people that you will want to see and you will want to hear. So it's not that the passport, you don't have time for it. It's really that you're making the passport too much time. And we do that a lot in our lives. We make issues or things we have to do more than what they really are if we just went ahead and did it. So whether it be the passport, whether it be taking your husband, wife, friend out to dinner, my thing is define success for yourself. And I promise you, you'll find time for all those beautiful things that we want to do. So thank you. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that thought. Um, that is something that I'm very, very um, keen on is what is considered success, right? And um, I wholeheartedly would agree that success is really what we've decided. Um, and I think that there are factors that cause us to have more or less stress in our lives. But I definitely believe that our success should be solely based on what you deem. Um, one of the things that I talk about inside of the Excuse Me While I Live Intentionally program is a part of that. It's a, it's a releasing of expectations that don't actually serve you. And I remember that when I decided I was going to go minimal. So I'm not I'm not a minimalist, but I do live a lot more, a very much closer to minimally um, than I have before. Almost all of the closets in my home actually have, like I have storage beyond storage out everywhere, right? Because um, I don't keep a lot of things. So, uh, but that process was actually due to me reevaluating what success looked like. And it actually started with purses. Like, I mean, you know, we, we all know women love purses, right? But it started with the process of me actually making a determination. Do I like this purse because it says coach or do I like this purse because I like it? And making a decision about what success looked like to me. Right. And so like when we are making purchasing decisions, when we are thinking about where we're going to eat, when, you know, do we need to go to Capitol Grill or can we be comfortable with the burger joint on the corner that we know, you know, is amazing and tastes good. Right. So, um, yes, like, does it bring you joy? That is a that is a way. Um, funny enough that you had mentioned that, that I like to think about it because, and I, I wrote a whole blog post about this. My daughter taught this to me. My daughter was like maybe three. I feel, she was young. Like she was not talking. Um, she was not doing like a ton of talking, but I remember her telling me like those specific words. And she was like, I don't love that mommy. And I was like, oh, you don't love that. Well, you know what? Like, you know what, girlfriend, if you don't love it, you ain't got to deal with it, right? Like, how do you, like, let me foster that in you. You right. You should love it. If you don't love it, just let it go, right? And so she, I promise you, my daughter just turned seven. I, I, she lives like that today. Like, she will tell, I will do something to her hair and she'll be like, I don't love it. Can you do something else? Like, okay. I mean, you know, and, and of course, you know, it, it's a, it's a cute little thing. She don't get too far with it, but she lives like that. Like she asks herself if she loves it, if not, if I like it, if I love it, like I said, I should live like that. And I have to find that blog post somewhere. I wrote it on another website that I, that I had before, but I mean, that's a, that's a real thing, right? Does it bring you joy? So thank you for that. 
Awesome. Anyone else? What we got? Go ahead. Can Wait, you what? give the oh I'm sorry. Can you give the four D's and five F's again? Just pronounce, please. Yes, I can. So the four D's are um if you're going to do it yourself, if you're going to delegate it, if you are going to defer it, and if you are going to delete it. Those are the four D's. And then my five F's are uh, friends, family, and fun. Uh, yes, I know that's three, but it's all in one. Mm -hmm. um, your faith, your fitness, your finances, and your field or your yeah. job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. I try to put that into a holistic picture for myself. And like, how are my buckets in each of those levels? Right. And if my bucket is low, too low, and you got to determine to that point, Andrea, about like, what is your, you know, what is success? You get to determine what is a full bucket for you. Like, does my bucket need to be at 70%, 80%, 90%? I don't recommend your bucket going below 60%. But like, what determines, you know, a what, what feels good to you as an acceptable level so that you can make a determine that if an area of your life drops below that level, you know where you need to start focusing some attention to bring it back up to where you feel good across the board about your life. Um, Go ahead, Ty. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, Jace, just to let you know, I'm I'm attending kind of on behalf of Cedric Lipsy. Um, oh, awesome! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, very, very much looking forward to connecting with you guys a little bit later. But uh, just to speaking on productivity, you know, and I, I by nature, I'm a perfectionist. Uh, I've, I've had that problem for a long time, so I was always about uh, paralysis by analysis. I've learned recently that half-assing things can kind of be a good thing at times. You know, in certain situations, like whether it's working out. You know, a lot of people are like, well, I don't have 10, I can't work out for the full hour, so I'm just not going to do it at all. Well, sometimes working out for 10, 15 minutes, obviously that's better than not doing it at all. Same thing with like, you know, a meal, like I can't, I can't, I don't have the time to prepare, you know, a full nutritious meal. Well, maybe I can just, you know, rustle up some salad in addition to my burger or something, or my hot dog, you know, that again, it's, um, I, I've kind of learned to be able to let go of that, of that need for control. Yeah. Um, and sometimes just to do it. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a hundred percent in some situations, you know, less than hundred percent can be, can be good enough. So you're a hundred percent right. Well, first tell Cedric, I said, Hey, um, and then, uh, you're a hundred percent right in that space. So thank you for sharing that because we talked about that a couple of weeks ago when I talked about like, what is your plan B? Right. So, like I said, if I have my, I have my ideal morning routine, if I can't do that, the, the thing that I revert to is just my three gratitudes. Right. But what that does, what you're referring to Ty is that it is, it is the thing that keeps your habits in place because, how many of us know that it is so much easier to break a habit than it is to build a habit? Actually, let me take that back. It's easier. <laughs> it, this is this is how life does us, right? It is easier for us to break a good habit than it is for us to build a good habit, right? And it's harder for us at times to break a bad habit, right? In place of doing something that is good for us. So when we think about that, like when you are working on a habit that is to your benefit, like the eating right, or, um, you know, you're working on, um, um, what else did you mention? Like going to the gym, for example, that habit of doing something that is in our best interest, uh, if you cannot do the full thing, 110%, do a minimum. If I can't get to the gym for an hour, right? I talked about this um, before. Like my, I have a 20, 20, 20. I'm going to do 20 pushups, 20 sit-ups, and 20 squats. And I'm going to call it a day to keep the habit of me working out every day. I like to work out Monday through Friday. I need to be able to keep that habit in place, even if a day gets tough and I can't do the entire thing. So that is a tool to be able to ask yourself, like, what's my plan B, right? And I always say my friend, um, my friend Andre calls it an adversity management system, right? How do you manage the adversity that will come? Something is going to come to throw you off your game. How do you manage that in order for you to stay on your game, even if it's not at the, at your peak performance, right? But maintaining that habit through a tough time will benefit you on the other end of that tough time, because you will make it to the other end of that tough time. Thank you for sharing that. What else we got? Awesome. 
I hope that you all found this helpful. Um, please do share this out. Um, this is the High Performance at High Noon call. It is at noon Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you would like to learn more about the Excuse Me While I Live Intentionally program, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. Um, we can set up a time to talk about what you're experiencing in your life and how I can help you. I appreciate y'all for rocking with me during this tough week. You guys have... Thank you. You got my back. That's my discovery session. So go ahead and book a call with me um, if you'd like to learn more about the program. And um, I do. I appreciate y'all just rocking with me and giving me a chance to just process with y'all in real life. Like this is real life, right? So um, I appreciate y'all and I will see you. Um, can you share who is the guest for Black Capital? Why are you trying to put it out there? You, you just need to get a ticket no matter who the guest is. <laughs> <laughs> we have Black Capital coming up. That's a whole separate thing because that isn't under this brand, but nevertheless, Black Capital is coming up April 22nd. If you are a small business looking at how to access capital, um, you can go ahead and get signed up for Black Capital. You can find that at bbiprofessional.com. And I don't have that information being released yet, but I hope to have that information solidified by the end of this week. So we shall see, but it's going to be amazing. Um, if you want to learn about accessing more customers, more contracts and more capital, you can do that. So I thank you for that plug. And um, I hope that you all meet me here again next Wednesday at 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you. I'll send you a link. I'll send, or actually he just put that link in, but I'll send you a link, Jay. Okay. Thanks guys.